welcome to the Journey of an Aesthete podcast, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. Hey, Persephone. Hi, this is uh, Mitch Hampton from Journey of an Aesthete. Yeah, how are, how are you doing? How are you doing? Welcome to our to our show. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of different kinds of guests on the show. And, you know, some guests are people I've never met. I just know their work or know them from their work. And then there are yeah. other, other guests I know personally really well. And then there are guests somewhere in the middle. And I guess that would be, I guess you would be one of the Guess that I kind of yeah. knew back when you lived in Boston, right? Yeah, I met you through. Um, I, I, I think I think Darcy Leonard may have introduced us, um, ah. but I know I when I did. Um, I was the general manager for Una's. Ah. I believe you came in there as well. I, I, yep. For some reason, I remember that. Um, what you? What, I remember you because yeah. I, I I remember meeting you a few times. Mm-hmm. Um. I think I met you with Darcy when Darcy was in Boston. I believe it was, I want to say, Two, it was sometime around 2008. Yeah, 2008. 2009. Nine, I, I remember that very, yeah. very clearly. Yeah. Uh, I, knew, I knew you were involved. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason. Yeah, it was around that time. The reason why I wanted you on the show is that I wanted to do an episode in which I get more personal than usual. And yeah. on Amanda's show, Amanda Antunes, who also was living in Boston at that time, I mentioned uh, my autism or my Asperger's yeah. diagnosis. And one of the reasons you're on the show, of course, you're a you're an artist, a visual artist, but yeah. it, it also appears that you're you're an a- a- autism activist of, of a kind because you have yeah. a you have a group on Facebook called Neurospace. Yeah, and there's so many things we could talk about. We could talk about your designs and your painting or your life story. I mean, typically what I do on my show is I do a linear chronology. Uh, so I sort of start okay. tend to start from the beginning of things, and uh, the the guest will move forward. And as the guest moves forward in a linear fashion, non-linear things start to happen, like things pop into consciousness, and it it, it could be quite a journey. Yeah. Yeah. So, what comes to your mind first about your any of this? Um, I'm not sure what really comes to mind first. Uh, I know Amanda as well. I remember her from. Also, I worked with her at Una's. Um, that's probably what just came into my mind first mm-hmm. when you mentioned her. Um, so that's interesting. I haven't. I haven't heard from her since then, really. Though I know that we're friends on Facebook as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, I started, I started Neurospace a couple of years ago, almost two years ago in May, so like, um, a year and a half ago now. Um, just because, um, I felt like I had already been in, there was a few groups already on Facebook that were geared towards autistic people and Asperger's, et cetera. Um, but they were very like they were either very like general or, or at least at the time they weren't really um, they weren't really groups that had like a focus on talking about creativity or special interests or really venting or have like um, a place for people that are maybe um, more marginalized to, to talk. A lot of them kind of were just like a dumpster fire. And a lot of them still are. There's a lot more groups now as right. well. Um, so, um, and I also created it because on my personal Facebook page, it was difficult for me to like have these discussions a lot mm. because, you know, I do have autistic friends, but I also have friends that aren't autistic. Right. And so, it was difficult to like really engage because there you have people that have all these stigmas and false information and stuff like that. And then it gets to people arguing and then people 
you know, and then I, I also just felt like I also needed a safe space myself. So it's also right. a safe space. So I created it and I, you know, I invited, you know, people I knew into it and, um, from other groups and, um, people that, you know, weren't autistic into it as well. Then I know that I, I felt benefit from space and provide, you know, you know, you know, cause it's inclusive of, you know, other, other, um, I mean, it's not just for autism, but, you know, ADHD or mm-hmm. any other, you know, mental or cognitive diagnosis that um, people may have. So it's not even really just geared towards autism. It's sort of where we can all just sort of find our common ground. Um, right. But it's been, it's been interesting because um, a lot of people that I know that I had kind of an inkling um, were autistic ended up getting diagnosed autistic, you know, autistic or ADHD or people that mm-hmm. I didn't know had already been diagnosed with those things or, or people that had already been questioning those things. I didn't know that, you know, where, you know, made their way into my group and, and found it very helpful. Um, so it's been a, a, a good space and I've made friends from the group as well because other people came in and other people invited other people. And there's like, um, almost 1,500 people in the group now, and it's, and it's, you know, I don't really, I don't promote it that much because I want it to be a space where, like, where people find it or it's word of mouth, so it's a little more of, like, a community than it is kind of, like, a lot of random people shouting at each other, you know, yeah. from all directions, so it, I've kind of just, like, made it a little niche space. And, um, well, it's a, yeah, from there too. It's a what beautiful, it's a beautiful group and I'm very impressed with it. And I'm impressed, oh, I'm impressed with many things about it. But, um, before we get back to that, do you mind doing the, uh, a chronology and, and also discussing, I guess your about your diagnosis, but also how you came to do the abstract art that you do that I see that's really good or just anything, oh, yeah. anything, uh, about your, you know, origins or past or up to present that you feel like uh, discussing? Because there's so, there's so much to discuss. Uh, there's more than the thing about it. I, yeah. I really like when I have guests on my show like yourself who do, who are very, I don't know, that stylistically diverse, who have, um, doing a lot of things, not just one thing. Yeah. So uh, talk yeah. about that. I also, I'm also ADHD, so that kind of comes across sometimes too. It kind of diversifies some my artistic traits, I feel like it kind of complements it. And sometimes it kind of makes it overwhelming. But, um, yeah, where should I start? I guess, you know, when I, when I was, I, I started making art. It was the first, I mean, art was the first way that I communicated. You know, I, I did have a speech delay. And um, I did have developmental delays in childhood. And, I, you know, it was when I was four, when doctors were telling my mom, um, that I was autistic because I had, mm. I was very sensitive to touch and mm-hmm. I had repetitive behaviors and speech delay. And, um, like my grandmother, for instance, um, she, I, I would call her MAGA and so my brothers would call her MAGA as well because of the speech, de- speech delay. That's how I said her name. And, um, when I was older, I figured out I'm also dyslexic and that's probably mm. played a part in it as well. Um, cause I didn't really understand what dyslexia was and mm-hmm. it makes, makes a lot more sense now to me. And it, it, you know, it has its advantages and disadvantages. It's very interesting the way these things are. They're looked at as disabilities when a lot of times, depending on the circumstance and the perspective and where you put them into, you know, what, what situation you put them into, you know, a person who's not dyslexic could be disadvantaged in a situation where someone's dyslexic could be advantaged, to have an advantage. Yes. Because people with dyslexia tend to see bigger pictures. Interesting. Tend to see the bigger picture. Um, yeah. Because you, you, we're, we analyze the scope before we analyze all of the details, so we see patterns really quickly. Right. And we, it's also related to synesthesia, synesthesia so yeah. we tend to remember things in patterns. Um, but anyway, going back to... Um, my childhood, um, 
Yeah, so I, I, as soon as I could pick up a crayon, I started to draw, and I, was, I became very good at re- realistic drawing, very mm-hmm. young, and I was considered um, gifted in that as a young child, and I was been, you I, know, I, hold, hold that, stuff hold like that. that. Do you mind holding that thought for a second? I wanted to interject and say that I'm I'm sort of the opposite. I always make jokes about how I can't draw, and and I'm yeah. and, I, and on my diagnosis, um, I'm visually impaired. I mean, not not in terms of blindness, visual impairment, but in terms of comprehension. Yeah. And it's so interesting how we we have a similar how people with the same diagnoses can have you know opposite uh, strengths or yeah, opposite it's on the, it's, 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 on, it's yeah. on the same spectrum, but it's uh, different ends of a certain process, you know, you, you can have, you, yeah. you know, someone who's dyslexic and then someone who's hyperlexic. Yeah. You know, people that are dyslexic tend to be more visual and people that are hyperlexic, people that are, you know, read, are better at reading mm-hmm. um, and read, read very young can be less visually, yep, but less mean, visual yeah. learners. Um, but they are, you know, that's the continuum there. Um, Would you mind describing so, what it is to be able to draw like that? I just, I just, I'm always marvel that it's a gift that people have, and I and I marvel uh, marvel at it. What is it that you see? You say you did realistic drawings. Do you just able to sort of see something in your environment and transcribe it through your hand or through your through your? Um, uh, is it? I I would fixate on on things. I guess in typical autistic fashion, I would I would take, fixate on. Um, uh, different cartoon characters or different um, different television characters. I was I really fixated on portraits for a long time, huh. and I'm still pretty good at good at those. Um, yes. I would I would generally, if I wasn't fixated on like I would fixate on Garfield for a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, would draw different characters from Garfield, for example, um, and I was also fixated on drawing with. Is, and I would always win the Halloween cost, uh, contest in school for drawing the witches' faces. But I was also I would also just draw portraits, and they weren't really of anyone in particular. They were just sort of like I don't know. I just drew portraits, and and um, apparently my my mom has my grandmother had it. Now my mom has it. Um, the drawing of mine I did when I was like seven, a very realistic. Drawing of a lady in like um, Victorian dress. Mm-hmm. I just drew from memory. Wow. Um, com- uh, just complete Victorian dress. Wow. Um, I don't even know where I came up with that. I just probably saw it and then drew it. But I do have, I guess, what you would call a photographic memory. Oh, I see. Um, because I, I remember things in pictures. Oh, so, and so it, when think, I'm thinking it's so interesting. And when I'm speaking, yeah, when I'm thinking and when I'm speaking, I'm. Um, I'm processing those thoughts and images, mm-hmm. and that's part of the reason why I have difficulty making eye contact. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was younger, it was that mixed with anxiety, and now I have less anxiety. I have less social anxiety than I used to. I still kind of do if it's a loud environment, but um, for me, I, I, eye contact is more, more difficult because when someone's talking to me or I'm talking to them, mm-hmm. Either way, you know, when I'm listening or trying to process my thoughts to speak, I'm visualizing either what I'm trying to say or right. what they're saying to me. So my eyes aren't looking at you. I'm literally looking into my mind, as, into the visuals that I'm processing based on what you're saying. Mm-hmm. So sometimes people will think I'm not paying attention. Yeah, that's a big, you know? that's a big frustration. I mean, the thing, the irony, of course, for me is that I, I'm always have exact recall and I'm take very seriously what people say. And I'm, I'm, yeah, pay, I'm paying, I'm paying, I'm paying more attention than the, the next person in the room usually. And, yeah, and with yeah, more I'm, seriousness, but, I'm be, the same way. Yeah, be, but because I'm not looking at their face because that's almost too much information, I need to focus on one thing at a time. I've often, yeah. they often do, you, you've been through this, that thing where like, oh, you're not paying attention because you're not looking right into my eyes or you're not, you know, yeah. it's that classic, classic dilemma. <laughs> so. Yeah. And often like people will say something or, you know, I have this frustration a lot with people will, where I'll remember exactly what they said to me, but then later they will, um, 
I guess go against what they said or oh, they always renege. Different. They always yeah, renege, and, then, and nobody, nobody's in that sense. Everybody lies, but it's it's interesting. But and, and it's but it's actually not lying. They really mean. I mean, they're very, they're genuine. They're 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 acting in good faith. Um, yeah, they just they just they don't, remember. They don't remember. Yeah, something. they remember I don't the really know. Yeah, but you know, you you I remember exactly what they said. Yep. And they seem to not remember. I have this problem with my mom a lot. She's like, they yeah. you know, they won't remember what what they said, but I'll remember it. It will kind of frustrate me because I'm one of those people like, when I say something, you know, I meant it. You know. Oh yeah. Um, occasionally, you know, if I have an emotional outburst, I may say something, you know, that's a little more emotionally, uh, what do you call it? Um, charged. Emotionally charged. But it's nothing. Right. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, I, it's not, I don't lie in those circumstances. Sometimes I'll be a little more emotional, yeah. but these, you know, other people just in everyday conversation, you know, they, they won't keep the same, um, you know, story or whatever, or yeah. the same, the same, um, I don't even know what the word would be there. Like, well, they don't, they don't, what my, my, I have a theory about that is that, you know, a large, I won't say most because I'm not sure it's a clear majority, but most people speak from their emotions and, yeah. and they actually live on their emotions. That's, that's basically 24 seven. That's mostly where they are and they speak from that. Yeah. They, they don't speak from some kind of comprehensive, carefully consider they know this nothing's carefully considered or crafted right it's like the opposite of, of, of a good piece of prose their speech yeah and, and since that a, makes a lot of sense and since a, think- right right but behold that thought but since emotions by definition are inconsistent and changeable like even uh-huh. opinions therefore the story can't be straight because if they're always speaking from feeling their feelings going to be different on wednesday than monday and i don't yeah. i don't think that that's again that's not a character judgment it's actually I think that's just the cognition of, of those people, uh, just what their cognitive oh, yeah. style is. That's you a know. good point. We could talk about that because too. The, the only time, in, yeah. yeah, they only, like I said, when I'm emotional, I may have more emotionally charged things that I say. Um, but those are, you'll know when I'm emotional, you know, yep. when I'm just talking like I am right now, I'm not in any emotional context yet. When I have a conversation like this with, say, some I'm random neurotypical. Yeah. They may say, you know, there's, it seems like they're talking straight. They're, I guess they would speak speaking from their feelings or their emotions or what they want me to hear or, right. you know, what they think is good in that context or whatever. And for me, that's really confusing because I'm just, you know, right now I'm just speaking not from any emotional place. I'm literally just giving information, you know, and yeah, it, but it information a that's, lot of times. That's true. But I mean, for me, information always has a little emotion attached to it. Maybe not a lot. But yeah. you know, there, there's no such thing as neutral, and you know this. There's no such thing as just neutral facts. We have feelings about yeah. about the fact of the food. We have to like the food that we don't, and we have feelings about the weather. And so, that, so the weather's a but fact. There's a that, consistency, you know, and yeah. it's either you know there, there's a consistency. Like what I'm saying now, is not going to change from the same stuff that I say tomorrow, unless I get more information and mm-hmm. a fact to back up whatever I'm saying. Like you know, your context with emotions that gives me more information. Um, like, I think a lot of times people, um, they can use uh, empathy and sympathy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of times with autistic people and people with ADHD, um, that we tend to, are the more solution-oriented in situations that are, um, let's say like S- situations you know, where people don't want a solution perhaps at the moment. Yeah. Not, like, yeah, yeah. Like where somebody finds out some bad news, yeah. um, you know, like they're, you know, like they find out, you know, they lost their job or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Something yeah. like that. When they find out some bad news, you know, I, I've run into this problem before where like, I'm a lot more like to personally a lot more like solution, solution oriented and, and whatever. And I'll just give, I'll try to come up with, you know, things in my head that pop up, you know, that I think of when, you know, someone, for example, like lose their job or something, you know, I'll get suggestions. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what I've realized is people, they want 
sympathy. Right. And because I'm like, I'm not very, I guess I'm not, I'm more empathetic than I am sympathetic because I definitely have empathy, but mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I don't give the type of sympathy that they're looking for where they want me to kind of wallow in the moment mm-hmm. of sadness that I'm really, I'm unable to really, um, that's not really where my context is in those situations, you right. know, um, especially when I'm dealing with other people. So that's just, that's definitely a, an interesting situation that happens a lot in miscommunication there. Yeah. Because there's been a lot of, you know, false false information and even in textbooks where yeah. you know autistic people and children are are said to lack empathy and it's really yeah. you know at least in my circumstance in every circumstance that I've observed yeah. every autistic person that I have come across yeah. has quite a quite a deal of empathy you know I mean, that's a, a, that's a real feeling. that's and a we real tend to shut down in those situations that's a real, because of that real problem with some psychiatric literature out there and some popular psychology literature, we can get into that about, yeah. mi- about misinformation. I mean, I, when I got my diagnosis, I got it at age 49, which to me is extraordinarily late. You know, it's a lot of my yeah, life it living. to a lot of people, though. Yeah, but one of the things I loved about this doctor is she, she talked about my, my emotional sensitivity and my empathy. And so uh, that told me that this doctor was, was more, up, you know, I don't know what term he was, was more with what, you know, more um, knew what was going on, wasn't, wasn't buying yeah, into a lot of the, yeah. the stereotypes. Now, you, you used a word in passing that it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that some of our audience might not, not know. Uh, and it's the word neurotypical. Yeah. Um, how, how would you describe that word, which is a word that neurotypicals don't like to hear about themselves, of course, but, <laughs> but, but how, if you had to sort of give a, a sort of a, just a neutral description of what that refers to. Or what that means? Um, well, I guess there's different. Um, there's sort of different um, perspectives on it. There's people use the term holistic and neurotypical, mm-hmm. and I can try to remember sort of those two things. The holistic is the person who's not autistic, but also not neurotypical. They're neurodivergent. Oh, interesting. But they're not autistic, which I remember being definition for holistic, and then oh. neurotypical is. A person whose cognitive functions and brain structure are within the typical, um, typically understood and um, generally, what do you call it? Generally, so like, are um, you saying it's are you saying it's something akin to a statistical norm? In a very yeah, in a, a very value norm, neutral neutral sense. I wouldn't yeah. even use the word normal. I would just say. Because I don't believe anything anyone's normal. No, no, I mean when I use of, right, but when I use the, the word the, right, it's the one that's it's just the uh, it's the one that fits inside the box. Yeah, you know? I guess I'm using I'm using that's the word the right. I'm using the word <laughs> I'm using the word norm not to mean normal in the in the I'm using the way a sci- the scientists would use it in terms statistically common or st- statistically. Yeah. Uh, I mean, another word you could use that's more loaded is conventional. Yeah, Perhaps. and it fits within the, the you know the standards, yeah. the functioning standards of our current society. So yeah, it's, it's people who function have the cognitive and functions and structural capabilities and yeah, um, you know neurologically that lend more typically and easily into how people learn and develop in this society because mm-hmm. everybody develops a little different on different levels. Oh, However, yeah. there's definitely a difference between autistic and neurotypical, despite there being differences both in autistic and neurotypical people, because yeah. they're not all the same. Right. But, you yeah. know, there's just um, but- the various components to um, our neurology that act differently in different circumstances. Um, so, may I ask when you uh, when you received huh? your, when I may I ask uh, when you received your diagnosis when that was and what where were you living at the time and what? Uh... Um, well, I was like I guess I was technically officially diagnosed a 
couple, I say like two years ago. Oh, wow. In Los okay. Angeles by a psychiatrist. Um, I already knew. I oh, knew like wow. for a long time. Huh. Um, and the reason I knew about when I was four as well is because I figured it out when I was like 24 or 25. Just because I had a lot of different... I had a lot of assistance as a kid, too, because it's, I had, you know, learning disabilities as well. And right. I just kept running into it. And people kept mentioning it to me as well. And sort of like offhand, I guess it would it would be suggested to me in various ways by different mm-hmm. people. Or I would stumble on it. Or I was to say something about the way I felt or the way I was seeing something or the way I was understanding something or just to, Communicating with people in general, people would always bring up how different, differently my perspective or my experience was in theirs. And it would always just perplex me. And Mm -hmm. so I like was very determined to figure out like what, you know, why am I so different? You know, it was weird, you know, because I never really, you know, as like a teenager, I knew that I had a difference. I had, you know, um, a 504 plan and IEP in school, uh-huh. but I didn't really think of, I didn't really have any awareness because there's no real education on it, which there should be on there being different neuro- neurotypes. Right. So I, you know, I, I always thought that I, you know, I was supposed to be operating within the realm of everyone else. Um, but there was something wrong with me or something, you know, you know, perhaps my other issues, you know, caused some kind of new thing. And, you know, I was, I would think sometimes I'd be like, do I have this, do I have schizophrenia? Do I have this mental illness? Mm, you know, yeah. and I would look into it and I'd be like, I don't have that. You know, I look right. into bipolar a lot. I'd be like, am I bipolar? But I wouldn't really fit into that, those boxes. Um, and then I kept coming across online because I would just type up like, by different symptoms, like early childhood memory, photographic memory, like all this different stuff. Mm-hmm. I would just Google it, you know, and it kept coming up, you know, early on, especially right. before Asperger's was sort of melded into autism. Asperger's kept coming up. Right. And then I would look at the diagnostic criteria for Asperger's and I'd be like, I have all of these things. Like literally, they'd be like, if you only have like, you know, 10 out of 12 of these things in your Asperger's, but I would literally have like all of them. And I'd be like, this is crazy, you know, why don't I, why didn't anyone tell me this? So I called my mother um, one time about it because it was just really bothering me. Mm -hmm. Um, And she was like, well, yeah, when you were four, you know, they were saying you work with all these things. And she she was in denial of it because she, her perception of autism is that you, are intellectually disabled. And mm. I had an IQ test when I was young, and I'm the opposite of intellectually disabled. Yeah, that, that, but what that's I was reading yes. online mm-hmm. is that, you know, conflicted with what she was telling me, but I was still just very confused because, like, okay, her perception is this, and um, yet other people are saying this, and I was really confused. So I put that on the back burner for, like, a decade or so. And then... You know, a few years ago, it just was like, you know, I really need to understand this and understand myself better. You know, you know, I've struggled a lot in my in my 20s with fitting in and figuring out different things and being yeah. overwhelmed, being overstimulated, and um, keeping friendships and um, connecting with people and unable to really figure out the dynamics of, you know, romantic relationships and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And just really even holding a job was difficult. And it just got to, you know, you get to an age where, you know, you really need to figure things out and figure out how you work and, um, you know, learn how you you are best going to fit into the, the world because we shouldn't be made to adapt to something that we're not. Um, yeah, that's really where it all started. You know, that's really it. That's, that's really an interesting two or three, two or interesting point about adaptation and not adapting to something you're not. And um, that makes me think of. Um, uh, I did want to go back and talk about the evolution of your artwork, 
because you yeah. because you're doing very abstract things at least the things that I've seen and yet you were yeah, doing you, yes. you were doing representational realistic things in the past yeah. and and then the autism do you want to talk about how all that the connection or the or the um if well, yeah, I guess there's two. There is kind of a connection because, you know, right when I got out of high school, um, I I started working, um, and I had to get a full time job. I had to find a place to live, um, and that took up all of my that took off all of my resources for a long time. Um, and I was really unable to create artwork until I was in my again in my thirties. So I went from wow being all absorbed and even getting like an art scholarship, partial art scholarship and other stuff in art as a child up until I was 18 to now being really unable to focus on it because I had all these other adult responsibilities that were really maxing me out. Um, and I would always, and then I was a dancer. I started um, dancing from the time I was 25 on and off until a few years ago. Uh-huh. And that it still brought me into a different realm of creativity and costumes and movement uh-huh. and you know an art uh, a way of conceptualizing art in a totally different way that kind of changed my view of um, creation and the process and how you can how things don't have to be, you know, a realistic re- representation. And I got kind of bored with that. Uh-huh. And there was a while where I, you know, due to me dancing that I was really more drawn to more sculptural work and more uh-huh. three-dimensional stuff, but it's sort of out, out of my realm, really. Um, well, if, if you're dancing, if, if you're do da- those things. Right, but if you're dancing, and, if you're dancing, that's kinesthetic intel. That's, um... I would. I think that that's a physical intelligence, almost like an athlete or something. Yeah, um, it is. and that and that's it, a. It, it informs my my abstract work now. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. Um, so really, it was performance art and dancing in that world. Uh, not only helped me with my um, social anxiety and um, really helped me to evolve in um, many different ways. But um, eventually when I was sat and really was ready to make art again, um, I, I feel like it gave me a more of a, um, a, a different perspective on how to create um, visual art mm-hmm. um, and really abstract it. Because it's, it's almost like performance art is, is an abstract piece of art, um, mm-hmm. piece of visual art in itself. And it's sort of, it's informed really for me from like kind of the same area. And I met other abstract artists, you know, as well during that time because a lot of dancers are artists as well. And, um, and another friend of mine, um, you know, she told me, you know, don't be afraid to make bad art. You know, don't be afraid. You know, don't. I really, and I re- that really sticks with me as well because I'm also a perfectionist. Oh, so man. just sort of stepping back and then letting myself um, loosen up and, um all of my art is really improvisational. Sometimes I'll oh, have wow. sort of um, a color palette I have in mind or a shape palette I have in mind uh-huh. or a, a, a loosely, um, I guess, con- concept of what it's going to come out as. There's a few that I kind of knew what it was going to look like in the end. But for the most part, it's almost like um, art therapy for me. I, I mm-hmm. let it sort of... I let it guide me as I, as I create. And so um, I've already sort of evolved in my process just through doing that. Cause my early works were really just me experimenting with the paints and colors. Mm-hmm. So they're a lot more muted and you'll see that they, um, 
they're a lot more abstract. Like they they're a lot less. Um, there's a lot less form in those because I was really just playing around with texture and the paint and getting the feel of it and not really thinking about what I was creating and just letting it when it when I felt it was finished, it was finished. Mm-hmm. Um, and then now, after doing that, of course, I've, I've restrained it a little bit. You know, with my two recent works, they're they're still abstract, but they have a little more form and a little more intention mm-hmm. in how they're coming out. And um, and so I'm, it's helping me to create my own style, mm-hmm. um, I, and I see my own style sort of coming out. And so it's very nice and freeing, and I'm still on that journey to really um, find the direction, but it's going in a direction, you know. Um, and I started painting again. It wasn't until this year, wow. and I hadn't really – I had painted a few different works, you know, in the meantime. They were a little more realistic um, over the past, you know, decade, but not very much. And I got really bored with them and um, just didn't really feel like – they had a voice, and now I'm sort of finding my voice, I guess. Um, so, That's you know, excellent. you know, sometimes it happens. You have a lapse, you have a creative mm-hmm. lapse, and it comes back, you know, and that's really how that all evolved. And for me, as an autistic person, um, my, my photographic memory and my, uh, my gift in art as a child would be considered a savant skill because that's not a skill that's normally amongst the population and especially someone who um, has learning disabilities um, on top of being autistic. Um, that's considered a savant skill. And what happens with people who have skills, specialized skills mm-hmm. um, like, like mine is when we are when we are forced to adapt or have to push that energy into something else like working or, mm. or, um, you know, other thing, other life things that are very difficult for me to do, mm-hmm. like a juggle and do that. And art at the same time, um, we, we tend to lose those specialized skills, um, mm. because we, we have difficulty compart- compartmentalizing. Mm-hmm. Um, those things, it's like really zero or a hundred with a lot of things, with a lot of autistic people, with, especially with our special interests, um, mm-hmm. our specialized skills too. Um, so being able, I think with COVID too, being able to step back and have a little more time to dedicate to myself and rest, mm-hmm. I was able to start creating again this year. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it took me, you know, a while to get to that place. But, it, you know, I don't feel anybody's too old to, you know, pick back up and, you know, get back into their flow, you know. Um, that, that reminds yeah. me of um, this book I read a long time ago called The Myth of the First Three Years. Everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. Which is a kind of a walk... It's a wonky psychology book about lifelong learning and about just That's basically just basically how learn, le- learning is never ends. It's lifelong. And, the, and, and although, although the first three years of life are, are important, they're not, they're not everything. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're not, they're not deterministic in the kind of rigid, yeah. rigid way people used to think. It's a really good book. Yeah. Made, made me think about yeah, it. You're discussing – um, lifelong learning. Yeah, and I'm I'm a lifelong learner. I'm always trying to absorb information. You know, my uh, you know, I do have you know special interests. Like I go very deep into music history, and it also oh, wow. I know you're a fan of of early early fashion as as well. I'm also yeah. 
a nerd in that realm and I've been a picker and a general manager for different thrift stores and I've worked yep. with various different stores doing that because I'm a, you know, it's really, I didn't realize it at the time, but it's, it's, it's being autistic has given me the ability to look at, you know, a, a, a pile of clothing, mm-hmm. let's say, and know which pieces are from what time you know, that's great. You can you can tell the era. You're like, you're like that's 1962. That's you know, 1957. Yeah, exactly. That's 1978. Yeah, that kind of. Yeah, and like yeah. the fabric and knowing you know. Yeah. The zipper and the even the cut, you know, or you know, really mm-hmm. who either the designer was influenced by or mm-hmm. whatever, you know, and um, that's really when I worked at Una's in Boston. Um, I started out just as just as a regular sales clerk in the store, but um, uh, Ellie, who had um, oh, yeah, know you know Ellie. taken over the stores, she had noticed that I had that ability to to see that, and so she pulled me out of the store, and then I became the person who um, who dated and priced all of the items coming in. So she would go on a buy, she would bring them back, and then I would be the one dating and pricing all of them because Excellent. I was very consistent and I understood mm-hmm. these things and she was also very anal about it herself. And so I, I rarely got anything wrong. Um, right. So then I became the general manager of that store because of that. That's and I implemented a whole system that, you know, changed the store. That's fan- That's such great to hear about that. I did not know any of this and I'm, I'm learning about it. Um, yeah. There's so much to discuss. You mentioned music history. I wanted to ask you about, what part of musical history you're an expert on or study. And really then I wanted to, I wanted to ask. It's so many, it's sort of something, it's one of these, like a lot of things, it's, I was very much involved in it from the time I was very young, like an adolescent until I'm still into it now, but it's sort of like a peripheral interest of mine, but I really was deep into um, early, you know, avant-garde electronic and music oh. concrete, uh, concrete, I guess. Yeah. That's how you pronounce it. Um, and then um, really into, you know, 60s garage music, uh-huh. different obscure, um, you know, artists in that scene, you know, progressive scene. Um, and you can go anywhere, really. I don't even know. You would have to just give me give me a genre and I could probably go into it. Um, I was very, very, also I was very for exposure. I was, I, was, I was really fortunate when I was at New, New England Conservatory of Music. Uh, John Cage was an artist in residence. Oh, that's awesome. One year, and I got to meet him and actually oh, that's awesome. yeah, go to his master classes and hear him talk about his, his philosophic ideas, about which, he's, oh, yeah, he, which, which, as you know, he's very articulate. He's extremely articulate, and he can go on for quite a long time um, about them. Yeah. Yeah, he's definitely he's he's a he's one of my favorite, you know, conceptual. He really laid the groundwork for a lot of different artists mm-hmm. um, who followed followed him. Him and um, you know, I'm really I'm really a fan of like Sun Ra and Harry yeah. Parch and you know artists in that vein of music. Um, I have some of their records still and. Mm-hmm. I got deep into different rare and obscure stuff, especially because um, it's another thing too. Is like you know, I'm such an an online nerd, I guess, of having blogged out to autistic people. That um, uh, when I was in my early twenties, like 22, I it was like early Facebook, and I used to I was really obsessed, really, really more obsessed with um, music at that time, and I would post a lot of music I was listening to like every day, like constantly. Mm-hmm. That was my thing. And it was just yeah. like a constant rotation of stuff and it was like a lot. Um, and uh, I ended up, people you would friend me on there and find me, mm-hmm. they were musicians and I'd go to shows and I meet musicians and they would add me and their friends would add me. And, you know, so I've even put up people from all over the world, like Finland and Netherlands came to stay with me. Oh, wow. Um, different, you know, experimental artists. Um, well, that's really, but, you know, that's a good thing. Stuff. Yeah. That's a and, good thing um, to do that when musicians are traveling. That's beautiful. 
Yeah, yeah. it hasn't happened really in the past decade or so, but it used to be more common. Mm-hmm. But there was a lot of just different changes and, you know, political changes and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, because I would post all these things, I guess. Um, there's a music distributor in, in Boston called Forced Exposure, and I guess I was friends with, um, you know, the people who run run it on Facebook through just because they um, – the people I was friends with had labels through, that were distributed through them. And they came across me on there, and um, they contacted me, and I ended up working for them for a few years. And um, not only just working, you know, in the warehouse, um, but, you know, I got to uh, be involved in different, um, different record projects through a label called Poon Village. Um, mm-hmm. I'm actually on, a, on one of the covers Excellent. of an Alberta B album. Um, so, I'll, I'm going to try to um, link to some of these things when we, when we, of course, when we do the, we do the inside the episode and I write about the experience of the episode and we always like to get a lot of, a lot of things from the artist. Mm-hmm. So, so feel free if anything's really important to you, yeah. like you really like something and you want to spot, put a spotlight on it, we'll spot, put a spotlight on it. Okay, uh, yeah. How did you, yeah, how, did, how did you end up in, in Los Angeles from Boston? That's quite a change. I mean, through, that's a, through my music stuff. Um, I so it's just like I, people became, I guess people would talk about me because I was so, I was young, young girl. Um, yeah. And I had such a deep interest in music that people in their 60s tend to have yeah. um, at that time. So I was kind of an oddity. And, you know, I have friends, you know, that are musicians that um, collect records, you know, and, you know, and I've met so many different musicians here and everywhere and people would travel and end up staying with me because I'd be the fan. Um, And it was um, this woman, Christelle, who has this project called Stellar Olmsdorf. Um, from mm-hmm. the Netherlands, who came to stay with me, um, and I put on a few shows for her in Boston, and she was on a tour, and she ended up in Los Angeles, and she connected with she connected me with different people in Los Angeles through Facebook, mm-hmm. and told me how much she loved Los Angeles, and how yeah. I should come out to Los Angeles, and raved about it, and then I just ended up building these online friendships with people who were, had very similar interests to me. As me and really, I, I I had a whole friendship community in Los Angeles before I even came here. So yeah. I would come out and visit, and I loved it because I would just, you know, I had a it was much more fun when I would visit because it was just like a new place and yeah. all these new friends. And you know, I developed very deep friendships here through visiting. And so I just ended up, you know, I've lived here twice. I lived here for a few years, moved back to Boston, mm-hmm. and then came back um, now. So. I don't know if this is where I'm going to be permanently, but it's definitely a place where I was drawn to just through my interest. Um, and, the, you know, there's a lot of people out here that have very similar interests that not only are from here, but have come here for the same reason. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what brought me here. Um, well, that's, those are all good reasons. I mean, I, I've said this before, Los Angeles in, in a way is kind of underrated um, because I use that word because, it's it's a serious, you know, as as you of course know. First of all, Los Angeles is a city so beautiful. The architecture and the and the um is to me extraordinary. Yeah, the Art Deco stuff. Yeah. Well, not ju- not just that, but all the different. There's so many different kinds of architecture in Los yeah. Angeles, and also there the really is. yeah, and also the 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 skyline is really beautiful. It's just it's it's, and the other thing about Los Angeles is for the arts. <laughs> Uh, is so important yeah. historically. Um, there and, is a lot of art. There's an art community here, and it really it's converged here from all over the world, especially in recent years. There's yeah. many different artists that you know I've known in different places that are here and come here, and it's a place you know not only where people land, but people come to a lot to show their work to perform. And it has an underground art and music scene, you know, here that's sort of like. It's sort of like there's little microcosms of it all over the place, but in Los Angeles, there's sort of like um, a convergence of a lot of it. 
Um, and it's sort of like a pulse, sort of like New York City, but even New York City isn't really what it used to be in. Los Angeles right. is kind of like what New York City was at one point, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's just really a hub of a lot of creative people um, that come together. Um, and there's great museums, you know, mm-hmm. there's... Not only is there great architecture, but, you know, there's, there's great scenery. There's mountains. You can go hiking. There's waterfalls. Oh, yeah. I you mean, know, the, the, yeah, that's the, uh, the – it's incredible. Uh, yeah, there's so many different things. Yeah, it's just really um, – you know, the people's image of Los Angeles, of course, is is, uh, is inaccurate and stereotypical. Based, yeah. I guess based on Hollywood, although Hollywood itself is a creative – is a creative institution, you know, for better and for worse. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, that's just an example of how Los Angeles just creates. Yeah. It's a place, it's, it's place for creative people. It's yeah. great for creative people. You know, it's become a lot, of, you know, a little more difficult. It's, it's a lot more congested now than it needs to be, but it's still a little more relaxed for me than Boston is. Boston is, Boston felt like more of um, a constant grind. Yeah. And like a hustle and more, it's more like, um, you're like, it's almost like you become a cog in a machine and here you can kind of like relax and, um, make money here and there doing various different creative things. Like I danced and, you mm. know, you can sell vintage. You can just kind of like, put your hand in various different things and you don't really have to be a cog in a machine here, you know, yeah. sometimes maybe you have to, whatever. And it's a really more of a place you can do like freelance sort of stuff and float around. And, um, it's, it's a lot more freeing for, you know, the creative mind here, um, than other places tend to be. I, I, you what know, I you... think in the future, I, I, I don't want to be more in, in Los Angeles or a big city, um, probably more, you know, a place a little more rural as they get older, that's a little less, um, you know, noisy, because that's where I'm really leaning towards, like, the Pacific North, Northwest. It still has some of what Los Angeles is, but it's a little less congested. Um, and, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's, you know, it's, it's worth, you know, anyone, you know, visiting, checking it out it's into yeah. art and music and, um, you know, at least when, you know, things are open, there's a lot of different, you know, underground um, places and spaces that, yeah. like I said before, like New York used to have this stuff, they had this weird little hole in the wall, easy yeah. type thing. But they don't. Really, I don't even know if they have that really there anymore. But LA is sort of like that for me. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I don't think that that part about it is really ever going to change. That's really just like a part of it, you know. Um, well, St- Stephanie, like, you have you have a platform here on my on my episode. Um, if you want to talk about anything involving autism, Asperger's, you know, you have a platform, an audience. Listeners that don't know, uh, clear up misconceptions, stereotypes, uh, um, you know, prejudices, um, exclusionary attitudes, bigotry, you know, the things. Yeah. What what would you, what what would you want to describe? What would you want to say to somebody who, to to, uh, perhaps free them from all that and and sort of um, talk about how, about, uh, um, neuro that people come yeah, in, for, people come with different brains and they come with in different char- uh, personalities, characters, and that, 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 that's okay, I guess is what I would say, but, but you, you should talk about it. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, like coming, going back to neurospace, you know, even in, in the community I have there, sometimes I have to be the person to be like, you know, like just, Yesterday, I guess somebody was, there was a whole COVID mask thing going on, mm-hmm. debate, whatever. And um, with autistic people, and one of the 
people were discussing it. You know, he had gotten COVID-19 and he had recently become sort of um, questioning masks and um, their effectiveness and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so he was coming from this place where he was um, having his own ideas and trying to put stuff together that isn't really digestible in the current climate and the status quo, you know, and he's not coming from a place where he's trying to harm other people right. or, you know, whatever. But the thing is, is with, you know, it tends to happen. It's happened to me. You know, uh-huh. I will have, I question things a lot and I have, yeah. you know, for me, I'd like to see, you know, why are we doing this? What does that mean? I right. need to know why I'm doing something, you know, how, yeah. you know, if someone just tells me to do something, I'm not going to just be like, okay, you said to do it. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to be like, why do I need to do it? You know, Oh, why, where did you get that information? What does that mean? How does it, you know, and, and try to relate it so that I understand it. Um, and so right. the way that we work is we just, we question things and we come up with um, sometimes answers that are difficult for other people to hear. You know, and I recently, I watched mm-hmm. the other day even, um, you, you know, Greta Thunberg. Um, yes. Uh-huh. There's a documentary on her now that mm-hmm. just came out on Hulu. Right. And, you know, she reminds me a lot of myself because I was also <laughs> an activist at her age. Um, yeah. And a lot of, you know, what she has to say is difficult for people to hear, um, even though it's not coming from even though it's coming from a place that is right, like it's correct. What she's saying is not yeah. wrong. Um, yeah. It's just different than what people, than how people are processing that information and what they know and mm-hmm. what they've been told. And so it happens a lot with autistic people. Um, and I guess what I would say to that is, you know, it's important for everyone to be open-minded yeah. and to listen to other people and hear their different differing perspectives, even if they challenge your own, even if it's like uncomfortable for you to hear that information, even if they may be somewhat incorrect, having those discussions with people and opening up and learning other people's perspectives and other people's information and other people's conclusions and theories, you know, helps everyone grow. You know, it helps me get information when I have those discussions, mm-hmm. and it helps everyone, you know. Um, and it, there's a misconception that autistic people are rigid, you mm-hmm. know. And in some ways, in some circumstances, we are and we may be. However, in some situations and circumstances, people that are, quote, neurotypical are as well. Mm-hmm. And these are the situations that I'm talking about now. Right. where they tend to be more rigid because they're a lot more, um, they're, they are, they have a tendency, at least generally, to not want to go against the grain or the mass, yeah. um, what do you call it, the status quo or the mass. Yeah, uh, convention. Yeah. Dom- um, dominated and conventional, conventional we, viewpoints. Yeah, and yeah. that can really stagnate mass consciousness. You know, so it's important for people to incorporate people with different ideas because people with different ideas and questions and um, perspectives that are differing from the mass, you know, population um, do tend to be neurodivergent people. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's where you include us. And we are very passionate about our beliefs. And a lot of times our beliefs tend have a tendency to be, at least from what I've noticed, yeah. I have a tendency to be very socially social justice and um, mm. really geared towards making the world a better place for everybody, at yeah. least from what I've observed, not only in myself, but other autistic people. But, however, you know, our conclusions, because we really hyper-focus and pick up details that others may miss or may not um, be aware of, yeah. um, tend to a lot of times rub people the wrong way because they're not ready for that information or they haven't heard it from their favorite news source right. or whatever. You know, it doesn't make it incorrect. It just means that, you know, it's not 
popular. You know, it's not, right. you, you know, there's all the information you need to get isn't, you know, blasting on a television. There's information everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's how, that's how new information emerges is by observing and, you know, building your own hypothesis on things and, and investigating it. Um, right. And that's really the world of the autistic. Okay. You know, if somebody were if somebody were to 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 ask you um to describe the word neurodivergent, is that kind of the same is what that word refers to? You think or neurodivergent doesn't just include autistic people. Um, it basically is anyone who doesn't happen to fit into what you would you know call a neurotypical person. Uh-huh. Um, I'm more you know I'm not just in. in Neurospace, I'm um, not just inclusive of, you know, autistic people. I'm, it's, it's a space for, um, oh, you know, all neurodivergent people, and even neurotypical people, if they want to learn and give, you know, a step back and, and observe. Um, yeah. But um, it's more of a safe space for all neurodivergent people to learn about each other. And um, for me, opening up it up like that, it just helps everyone to have knowledge of these different perspectives and different people that aren't, aren't just, we're not just all this autistic or all ADHD or all, you know, borderline personality disorder or, you know, bipolar or whatever, mm. you know, we all have some similarities and we have differences and we can understand each other and we can also advocate for each other mm. in this current society that we're, we're all marginalized in. Um, based on, you know, how our brains work. Um, so really there, there's, I guess it's called like the neurodiversity movement. Right. And I tend to, you know, my own, I guess, activism, as you would call it, tends to focus around, you know, the things that I know, mm-hmm. my own experience, but I do include others that have, you know, within my group and within, you know, what I would like to include. I just don't speak for other people. You mm-hmm. know, um, I speak for myself. So yeah. there also tends to be more of a platform where I give information about, you know, autism and ADHD too, um, more than others because, um, that's your experience. You know, I tend I to guess, lead yeah. it. Yeah. I yeah. tend to lead that group. Yeah. But it is open and open platform for, for everyone to speak, you know, when it, when I first started it, we did, um, a girl went live. She has, uh, disassociative identity disorder and she did a whole Q and a sort of thing in my group. And it was really informative and had a lot of engagement with, with people. Um, and I learned a lot about it as well. It was mm-hmm. informative for me to understand, you know, other people, um, how that works. Um, so including that, it was, was great. Um, I mean, that's something, you know, I like to include in, in there as well. Um, and, yeah, and, you know, tomorrow, every Thursday, I do, starting last month, um, I run a support group for autistic people oh. online through a group called Artism. It's okay. O-U-R-T-I-S-M. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, and so there's another activist who is in my group, and, you know, she reached out to me, and she interviewed me as well. We did a a video interview um, a couple of years ago as well. Um, and, yeah, and then they're based out of Redondo Beach, but they, you know, expanding into L.A. and stuff. And so the support groups, I guess, they're online now, but they're, they're also, you know, when there's no COVID, they're, you know, in person whenever that's going to happen again, and there were that prior. Um, but now, yeah, every Thursday at 7, I, I run a support group, and I hope to grow that too and, and run, run more support groups. And it's sort of like a place now where autistic people from anywhere can plug in at that time and, and meet each other and, and have a, and socialize and, and talk. Um, so yeah, it's, it's it's been a great you know forum to not only 
educate people, but to um, expand and be a part of, you know, other groups as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I can, I can give you information on that as well. When you do the podcast, maybe I can put a little blurb on Absolutely. On how you would sign up for that group on Thursday. Well, sure. I mean, of course, you, you being the guest, it's the you know that's uh, the priority is your, is your vision, um, and and certainly you have vision. You probably have vision about the future. I um, I uh, uh, always hate saying goodbye uh, on these yeah. these programs, but eventually I'm going to have to come to an end and say goodbye. But but before. Uh, I do that. I, I want to ask you, uh, if you don't mind, a more um, specific question about the role that uh, you see in the future of people like like you, uh, me. Uh, what do you think the strengths are or capacities that could that could be of that could actually uh, contribute? Just I know that's a very broad, general question, but. Yeah, well, I believe, you know, autistic people have always been contributors to society. However, autistic people haven't always been understood as autistic people until very recently in history. But historically, there have been quite a few people that you could look at and say, it's probable that they were autistic. You know, Mm -hmm. Andy Warhol. Warhol, definitely. Oh, yeah. um, Albert Einstein. Absolutely. You know, there's just various public figures that have contributed to society and science yep. and various different things where Emily if you look Dickinson. at their life and their mannerisms and who they were mm-hmm. and what made them tick, they, you will, when you begin to understand it a little better, you start to see it in people. Um, and now even, you know, like Gary Newman's autistic, Courtney Love is autistic, Tim mm-hmm. Burns is autistic, Bill Murray's autistic. There's Interesting. A, you know, plenty of people in the public eye that are autistic. They just don't really present themselves that way. It's like the first paragraph. Mm-hmm. Um, but we have contributed to society this whole time. We've always been here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. What I think for the future is that, especially now with the internet and with a lot of younger people really getting more understanding of, of these things. Um, and I feel just, I feel like younger people, it's like, uh, I feel like it's weird. I don't know. It feels like neurodivergence, autism and ADHD may be more prevalent now in younger people because it, maybe it's, something that has an advantage for the future, um, possibly. You know, yeah. you could see a lot of these things as being an advantage to our current situation and how to move it forward. Um, but I believe that understanding, you know, neuroscience and how different brains work is going to open a lot of doors for people to have a voice in those arenas and be able to articulate their perspectives in a way that will reach more people um, as being from that place. Um, because you look at, you know, a work of art by, you know, an artist like Andy Warhol, who is likely autistic. Um, amazing. And he changed amazing, a lot. Amazing he changed artist. He changed um, and, and came from a perspective that really, and when you think about it, it came from a very autistic place. Um, and, uh, but it's not understood that way. Yeah. It's just understood as being a different perspective and a new, you know, he led a different movement based on who he was. Um, and autism is a part of who we are. You can't separate it from the person. Mm-hmm. So it's not like really a separate entity from you. Everything that is you is that. Um, mm-hmm. but the understanding of these things is making and removing the pathology from it, I believe, Mm -hmm. is what's happening in the future to be more inclusive of it as being a strength in some situations as opposed to seeing the other side as having the strength in the the situations where they have the strength. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying in the beginning of our conversation, um, you know, having autism or ADHD or dyslexia in some circumstances, maybe we'd have the disadvantage. 
However, in other circumstances, the way our brains work may be the advantage, you know, in, in that circumstance amongst the neurotypical. Um, so people being able to see that is where I see it's going in the future because there is a huge stigma that still is, it still is there, you know, it's still lingering. There's still, you know, there's still camps with people that have a lot of um, stigmatized views still. But as far as younger generations, I'm seeing a lot more acceptance of the self and a lot more acceptance of these things as just being differences in who you are and they don't make you less of a person or less of a human. They just make you a different one and yeah. one who can utilize, um, you know, your strengths or your interests or how you work, you know, in a way that works for you and it can advantage, can advantage society given the circumstances that work for you, you know, you know, a lot of people, society for a long time has wanted everyone to fit in a certain box and work a certain way and have a certain life and meet this goal by this age and this time in your life, you have to be this way and, Mm -hmm. you know, you have to function this way or just this way at this time, blah, 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 you know, and I see for the future that, that sort of dissolving and people accepting and incorporating people who, you know, are different from Mm -hmm. that norm. Um, And so it's going to incorporate a lot more creativity, I feel, Um, at least hopefully. I mean, if we all continue in these groups like Neurospace to accept each other, Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I tend to be more of an optimist in that sort of thing. You know. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, that's so that's so beautiful. So yeah. That's so beautifully put. I mean, I, I I'm so. This is such a beautiful occasion on 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 my podcast that you you you're able to to say, not only say it but say it as eloquently as you just did. That's oh, um, I can't think of any better better way to to end this 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 beautiful episode and occasion. And I really want yeah. to th- thank you immensely for your time and generosity in talking about yeah, thank all these you as things. Well. Um, yeah, thank you for having me on the show. Um, yeah, and if you know you ever want to, if you have a slot again in the future, you know we could do another show at any time. And yeah, you. it was great talking with you. We'll definitely have you back. Thank you, Stephanie. All right. Be safe have a good there. night. Mm-hmm.